Business over drinks. Business over drinks. This is Dave and Tom. This is business over drinks. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Business Over Drinks. My name is Telling and I'm calling in from Singapore. Hello, 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 hello. Hello, lovely. Uh, my name is David calling in from Brisbane and it's the afternoon and we have a very, very special guest today. Very excited to speak, a little bit nervous to speak to him too. His name is Joel Hauer. So Joel, is that the right way to pronounce it, Joel? Hopefully it is. You nailed it. Yep, that's it. Awesome. Perfect. Excellent. We did our research. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Joel, I'm just going to refer to you by your first name because I'm going to get your surname wrong. So, so. <laughs> um, so Joel Howe is the founder and CEO of Liquorloot. Launched in 2016, Liquorloot is a home of alcohol subscription services, Whiskey Loot and Gin Loot, delivering three premium and hand-selected whiskey and gin tasters from all around the world each month. So after leaving the advertising world to create his own digital agency, Joel helped navigate the digital world for businesses of all shapes and sizes. This background in digital marketing and a passion for whiskey and gin made the perfect match for building Liquor Loot. Joel's goal is for Liquor Loot to gently guide subscribers on a tasting journey through the beautiful and varied world of whiskey and gin, which Tony and I love, in the comfort of their own home every month. His ambition is to make everyone as passionate about whiskey and gin as he is. It's a big ask, but he's confident that Liquor Loot can help you, lo- help you to love whiskey and gin every bit as much as him. Um, so welcome to the show, Joel. How are you doing? I'm good. Thanks for having me on the show, guys. Really excited to be here. No, thanks for having us. And thanks also for the, um, the lovely samples of, of gin you, you gave, Tung and I, which is a good quick segue. What's everyone drinking right now? <laughs> right, Joel, why don't, guess first. Why don't you go and tell us what you're drinking? Right. So you guys have got gin in front of you, which is uh, the, the brand that we've only recently launched, um, Gin Luke. And uh, I've got the, the inaugural um, one, the one that started with also Whiskey Luke. So I've got the pack in front of us right here. Um, and this is our traditionalist box. So I've got um, three different whiskeys in it. Um, so I thought I would kind of discuss it with you guys and see what to drink. Um, so we've got a uh, Arbelar uh, distillery, 40%, 12 years old. Um, so that's from uh, the uh, Speyside region. These are all scotches in this box. Uh, we've got um, Glenn Elgin, 12-year-old as well, and then we've got Klein Nanesh, 14 years old. Um, so that's actually one of my favourite. That's more of a smoky one, so I don't know about you guys, but I love smoky whiskey. And then I've got a couple of ones here which I'll um, bring out and chat about as well. Um, so I, I think uh, I, I can take your suggestions as well. I'll, I'll, I'll drink any of them. <laughs> Can you drink all so, of them into, and add them into one I, delicious bowl? I, Don't do I it. May actually, I may actually do that. <laughs> <laughs> Don't take me. <laughs> yeah, do, do your own blends, uh, Joel. Uh, so go with the 14 years. We'll, we'll go with that first. I think that's your favorite, yeah? Awesome. We'll see how we'll see. Favorite, Maybe yeah. through this podcast, you'll be knocking there back a few glasses. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So what are you drinking, Tone? So I'm actually drinking one of Joel's um, whisk, uh, gins that he sent us. I'm drinking a 70 degrees uh, classic dry. If you can see my glass, I've got a twist of lemon in here as well. It's also said to drink it with pink, pink peppercorns, but I did not have that. So I'm just going to go straight with the uh, lemon twist. It's a really, really good gin. I've just started it. So as we go along, you'll see me probably down it and pour a little bit more later. Yeah, Dave, what about you, man? Awesome. So, yeah, so once again, thanks, Joel, for this bit of product placement in here, but really loving the packaging. Uh, so right now I'm drinking the uh, Barossa Shiraz gin. So it's like a blood red gin and it's delicious. And so it's, just so I sound a little bit more educated, I'm going to read from this little guy that you get with, with the, the packaging that has a little, um, like, a, like, if you can see the screen, if you guys are watching on YouTube, it has... Um, like a flavor wheel of, of, of each drink you get and you can it talks about the nose and the taste as well as it has a little qr code that, let, that brings you to more content anyway so i'm going to read out the flavor profile of this uh, the nose so it's it's a massive burst of juicy ripe black cherries and rich red plums backed up with bags of baking spices and orange peels with a buttery note reminiscent of fresh hot cross buns fresh hot cross buns gotta love them buns perfect for easter there you go. 
All right. Okay. That was a really weird reference, Dave. Good job. Um, <laughs> all right. Why don't we jump straight into Dave? Uh, since you gave that really awesome, um, very weird analogy, why don't you start with the first question? Man? <laughs> you know, I'd love like to open up the floor to you, Joel, because you know, you're, you're the, the whiskey and gin expert. Um, you know, what's what's the best way one can kind of enjoy whiskey? Uh, that's completely subjective. You know, I, I think enjoying whiskey um, uh, starts with uh, wanting to enjoy it. <laughs> that might sound yeah. weird, but some people just, you know, will, will, will chug it back without any care for the taste or they'll mix it with Coke. That's not a bad thing per se, but it's it's yeah. different to enjoying whiskey. It's different to kind of savoring the taste and, 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 and um, not, not going for quantity over quality and just kind of refining your palate with some really good stuff that's out there in the market. Um, so there's no real rules uh, that you should kind of prescribe to as, as, a, as a blanket rule, you know, like no ice uh, or, or, you know, you've got to drink it at, at room temperature or anything like that. Um, it's completely subjective at the end of the day. So we kind of try and hint or guide people to how a, a certain whiskey might react to a certain style of drinking um but that's not kind of a, a one-size-fits-all approach it's it's really up to yourself and and, and the, what you're drinking as well I, I think there's one rule with whiskey drinking and this is just because i live in singapore and i've, I've drunk everywhere in southeast asia don't mix your whiskey with uh green tea it's disgusting <laughs> and it's really common in asia it's disgusting it? and i hate it have, have so you tried it joe it, it, it's oh, like, I haven't. I haven't even heard of that actually. Oh, it's really it's, popular here. Like they just yeah, chuck wow. the is right. It, basically, any whiskey I've seen them do it with a single malt as well, where they just pour um, whiskey and sometimes it's flavored green tea as well. So it's like uh, jasmine green tea or some sort of sweet green oh, tea. Oh wow! It is the most for me personally. It is the most disgusting thing I've ever had. So is that <laughs> get hot, very upset. Hot green tea, or once it's cold? Oh, it's cold. Just like cold um, packaged green tea that they just pour in. It's, it's just like a mix. It comes in a, like a big, like a Coke um, bottle or something like that, and just bring in the club. So it's like bars and clubs in in Singapore and South Asia. It's, <laughs> well, it's a really. I, I don't know if I would uh, be my first, the first to put up my hand to try that, but it sounds <laughs> interesting. <laughs> it is, and it's disgusting. I hate it so much. <laughs> Uh, so uh, actually, Joel. So I've got a I've got a question, right? So following up the whiskey thing, because you started gin quite uh, quite recently, like why gin? So why did you pick gin? Um, the the model for for liquor loot always was around launching with whiskey first. Uh, but when I came up with the idea and the concept and kind of started mapping it out um, around 2016, uh, I really wanted you know that that kind of ecosystem of, of brands that kind of work within each other. Um, gin was the obvious second one as a, as a runner-up to uh, whiskey and, and whiskey was the obvious first because I was so passionate about it and that's where my knowledge lied and I could build that brand, build the reputation and then kind of hire people that were more experienced in, in gin to build the content and, and kind of build a roadmap for the gin brand. Um, so it was a real obvious second because essentially, you know, you, you can you can use mixers, you can have it straight if you really want. Um, you know, you've got a huge variety of tonics. Australia has got over over two hundred different gin distilleries, um, so there's such a, a variety at home uh, and obviously internationally as well. Yeah, yeah, I think. Um... To me, anyway, whiskey and gin is like a progression of maturity in life. Like when I, when I was in high school, I, you know, I'd, I'd get whatever I could find in the fridge when my parents are away. Then uh, when I'd be in uni, uh, when, when I'd start to graduate to uni, I'd, I'd upgrade to Coolabah. But then after I graduate, start working, then then I'd go to, you know what Coolabah is, Tony? No, I don't, man. It's, it's <laughs> it's like, it sounds horrible. It sounds horrible. It's, yeah, it, it is. Uh, it's, it's like cask wine. It's like $10. Like you get a box of. And some people hang it from the, the clotheslines here and they drink straight from it. <laughs> but, but, um, and then I've upgraded to whiskey and gin. But you know what? To be honest, I'm, I'm very, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit of a simpleton when it comes to gin and whiskey. And I'd love to, and, and maybe our listeners would love to know this. Like, how do you actually, is there, are there any key, like if you go to a shop, right? And, and let's say you want to buy whiskey for someone or gin for someone. Is there any way to sound like an educated person when it comes to whiskey and pick the right choice? Like, well, 
is is there like a one whiskey gin one hundred and one kind of thing? The quickly share with the, us? Um, the, the I, I would say that the easiest way to go after for for beginners especially um, go after something that you know represents that smoother flavor profile. Yeah. Um, and there's certain regions in Scotland that uh, are known or more well known, especially when you're talking about single malts, um, for that smoother flavor profile. Uh, so Speyside is a region of, of Scotland uh, that produces a, a ton of whiskey. Um, so I would go and look for on the bottle and, and try and find the, the word Speyside. Um, that usually will, will mean that it's, it's a, more of a lighter, more floral flavor. Uh, not all the time, but you kind of better, um, uh, more, more chances of getting a lot of floral flavor from mm. Speyside than you do of, say, Highlands or, or, um, or ILA or something like that. It's going to be more smoky. Um, on the opposite side, uh, you know, some people say, okay, well, I've heard a lot about this or I've heard a lot about uh, Japanese whiskey. Um, so I'm going to go and grab Japanese whiskey and, and a lot of people might say, you know, the, the Hippikis and, and the, um, the Yamazakis really developed that region from a brand point of view, and, and now they're running out of stock. So I'll just go and get a cheap Japanese whiskey, and, and that's going to be completely different to the experience of an expensive Japanese whiskey. So there's, there's some kind of misconceptions out there. Um, yeah. Obviously, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be kind of a, an entrepreneur and a founder if I didn't pitch my own business. But uh, if, if it is, you know, someone that you're looking to buy a gift for and you don't know what their flavor profile or what they might like and you don't want to kind of risk buying a $150 bottle and, and they just keep it on the shelf and never open it or, or you know, just, you know, hide it from you, <laughs> um, then, then jump on Whiskey Loot. It, it's a way to kind of train your palate. Um, using tasters instead of that full bottle experience. Um, you can go on the journey yourself or you can gift uh, three or six or 12 months to someone else. Nice. I mean, that's a, that's a really And we will have a link to, to your website. Yeah. Yeah, we'll put a link on, on businessoverdrinks.com. Um, that's really interesting, Joel. Um, so one thing that I kind of saw, and uh, you were talking about this before as well, when we were doing research about you. So I did the research. Dave just copied everything that I sent him. <laughs> no, um, just, just FYI. Um, so um, one thing that was interesting is you mentioned that you're, you've been basically more people have been buying gin and whiskey since the pandemic started. Like everyone's just buying stuff. That's more, right. right? Um, and the research we've done actually shown that that's kind of a trend across the world. A lot of people are just buying alcohol because they're at home. I mean, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna incriminate myself, but I may have drunk more than I've ever drunk in my life. During the pandemic and lockdown. drink responsibly, so, everyone. Yeah, just, just drink responsibly. Don't do it. Don't don't do whatever I say. <laughs> yeah. Listen to my words, not what I do. Don't follow what I do. Um, so don't drink. Uh, but no. But uh, in in all honesty, um, uh, do you see this trend continuing for a long period, or was this just something that's purely a blip in uh, like a, a, a something that's just really random because of the uh, pandemic? Um. Uh, I think we're kind of talking about two things. We're talking about um, the propensity of people buying online. I think that's definitely increased. Mm -hmm. um, that's probably, you know, um, kind of moved forward about a decade of where it was and to um, the projections of where it could have been in, in 10 years' time. I, I think we've just kind of skipped that amount of time and, and uh, the, the um, increase is not going to die away. People love buying things online, getting things delivered to their home, and as long as, you know, the, the couriers and, and delivery networks can keep up, um, that shouldn't be something that will, you know, go back to, to, to pre-pandemic pre levels. Um, but with, with alcohol, I think, there's definitely a, a trend of people that uh, they're, they're wanting to consume and have an experience, and they're also wanting to consume less. And that's where you have the rise in kind of those no alcohol or low alcohol brands in, in wine, beer, spirits all over the world. Um, so I, I think if, if you're talking about kind of like um, low, uh, low volume or, or kind of, sorry, if you're talking about um, – <laughs> Something like a, a Johnny Walker that's, uh, you know, available uh, pretty much um, as a commodity anywhere in the world. Stuff like that will probably start to decrease and you'll see a rise of more of the, um, uh, the, the smaller brands, the home brews, um, those brands that kind of are telling a little bit of a different story and, and provide a bit of an opportunity to educate oneself on um, the history of that region potentially. 
I think those brands, um, even though it's a very fragmented market, once you get to smaller and smaller brands, will become the mainstream um, because essentially people are not consuming like they used to consume where it was all about volume. They're consuming because um, it's a conversation piece and they want to be able to talk about it and experience something new. So I think that's kind of where COVID has pushed a lot of the conversation. And why did you feel, um, I mean, you know, I'm sure that there was some research behind this. Why did you choose a subscription model rather than, uh, you know, e-commerce buy, buy the bottles now model? Good question. Um, the subscription model essentially gives people the opportunity to um, develop something and have an experience. Um, I think when you're buying a, a one-off pack, um, you're really limited to what's in that box and you either love it or you hate it, but you're not going to grow as a consumer. Um, with whiskey, I think it's, and, and gin obviously, it's, it's one of those things that um, the more you learn about it, the more interested you are. It's like kind of like playing an instrument. Uh, you're not going to be, you know, really fascinated on all the different types of guitars if you just pick up a guitar and play a couple of chords and put it down and walk away. You, you need to kind of have this time to develop your passion. Um, and a lot of people design not only to drink something, but learn what it is that they drink so that when they go to the bottle shop or when they're buying something for a friend or inviting mates over, they know what they, um, they know what they're going to like or they can have an educated guess of what they would like based on the label. Uh, so kind of mm. that experience lends itself to a repetitive purchase and, and a subscription e-commerce subscription is is kind of the perfect way to do that just like you have your kind of you know food delivery boxes and stuff like that it's mm -hmm. a way to kind of develop that habit learn more about food in our example obviously learn more about spirits oh really cool um no thanks thanks Joel. that was actually very interesting um reasoning behind going a subscription model versus a straight to uh e-commerce uh, marketplace so to speak um, so I've got a question though. I'm going to take a little bit of a different track because I want to really um, go back to your um, uh, history and your, your previous work as well. So you used to run a digital marketing agency and yep. um, you kind of like just, I wouldn't say pivoted, you just said, okay, that's enough. We're going to start a uh, liquor loot right now, right? So um, has, have, have you taken anything from your previous um, experience, previous role, your previous uh, agency and really brought it into a liquor loot as well? Um, yeah, most definitely. I think a lot of the experiences I had with um, uh, managing marketing budgets and campaigns and, and working across different brands um, and, you know, uh, I think it's a it, – it, it, I can kind of summarise it as uh, an entrepreneur getting access to, you know, we probably worked with 100 different clients over the, the couple of maybe four years there, um, having – access under the bonnet of the business. And there's nothing like having access under the bonnet of the business. You can read articles all day, you can talk to entrepreneurs, but if you actually, you know, jump in there and you can see their Shopify sales and you can see their email campaigns and you can see their AdWords performance, it's, it's really a, a unique way to learn um, because they're paying you to learn as well. So in, in digital marketing, you, you, you don't often go um, to that client and say, I've got all the answers and I've got um, everything mm. that that you need all packaged up ready to go because it doesn't exist like that. Things move too quickly. You need to be able to be agile and learn with them. And, and essentially, you know, I, I had the luxury of, of getting paid to learn with my clients on new strategies, uh, new ways to implement things from a technical perspective perspective um and beyond that just just managing a business and hiring staff and you know having to fire staff and and you know mm -hmm. doing performance and kpis and all that type of stuff lends itself to, to any business so um if you can you know grow within an agency and 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 um an agency is a great model because essentially you can be profitable from day one yeah. as long as you're paying yourself and yeah. uh you can you can learn all these tips and tricks to help you scale your own business one day. Yeah, that's great, and I think it's definitely useful. Um, I'll, I'll probably touch on that a point about that later, but I'm curious to know. So you've got all this digital marketing experience. You got an agency. 
how did that transition happen to being like the the whiskey and engine expert with a subscription service and so forth? How, how did that even happen? Um, I mean, I mean, the, it obviously it involves a bit of marketing, but there's a, that's a whole yeah. new different skill set. Oh, 100%. Yeah. I like throwing myself in the deep end. <laughs> um, so at the time I launched Whiskey Loot or Liquor Loot, um, I was still managing the other business. I didn't kind of close one and open the other. Um, and it, it was just a, a seedling of an idea. And what I did was kind of put together a bit of a landing page with, with the stuff. I mean, I had a designer, I had a developer, I had, you know, SEO and AdWords people there. Um, so I had the skills around me to, to get something up and running pretty quickly. Um, and what I wanted to do was just a, an MVP, kind of that traditional kind of startup mentality, put something out there, see what people say, interview people, get out of the building, you know, do customers, uh, customer interviews and, and really learn about, the value propositions that are important to people. Um, so that happened over the series of, of a couple of months until I was pretty confident with the business and the idea. And I had time to kind of flesh it out and build a brand. Um, and uh, at the time I was actually working on two startups, so Liquor Loot and um, one called uh, a real estate startup, which I, I won't mention right now. Um, and uh, then also the agency, um, and I also had a co-working space. I was running four businesses um, at the same time, which um, was crazy. Like I had. You to must have had a, a, an amazing work life <laughs> work life balance. There's so much free time. Just like oh, just basically so just napping. I was, I was yeah, just <laughs> sitting on the beach every day. <laughs> um, no, I, I got to a point that I was absolutely kidding myself. You know, I was doing you know Skype meetings from. Um, with overseas developers for one of the startups from, you know, from 8 p.m. till 11 p.m. every night. And I was waking up and being the first one in the co-working space to open up at, you know, seven and working on this this agency and managing staff and managing clients and, and all of that type of stuff and then trying to build a, another startup on the side. So it was crazy. I, I, I uh, decided that, you know, that type of lifestyle wasn't long term i couldn't kind of maintain it so i needed to to you know focus on on one or two and i decided to focus on um the startups um and then eventually i, I let one of the startups go I, I kind of passed the buck back to the co-founder that i was working with um that's a whole nother story and then focused 100 percent on um on whiskey loot and, and kind of launching um all the different you know areas that i wanted to focus on with that brand uh, but for the good, um, you know, uh, two years, it was it was pretty much myself. Um, I had help here and there from from a couple of people that came into the business and then left. Um, and it was it was you know very much on autopilot. Um, the model was a little bit different than what we had today. Um, and then kind of I, I got to a, a certain point that you know I, I gave up all of because I kind of transitioned a little bit, but I gave up all of my agency clients um, and I just focused on Liquor Loot 100%. There was no more co-working space. There was no more real estate startup. It was just uh, just Whiskey Loot, Liquor Loot, all, all of that. Um, and uh, that's when I really saw the business start to grow because um, it just had my undivided attention. Sorry, sorry, but was it... Purely a decision based on finances, like it just it was just a more profitable business, or what was what was the reason behind? No, no, it actually wasn't wasn't more profitable at all. That the agency yeah. was was killing it actually, <laughs> um, and uh, I I really had to make the decision as to whether I wanted a, a business that was really difficult to scale, um, or something that I could go to sleep at night and, and make sales while I was you know um, doing nothing. Um, so I wanted kind of that, that growth and that, um, that startup experience for us, less of a consultancy or agency or kind of freelance approach where you're selling your hours uh, to something where I've got a product, I've got a brand. Um, it can grow if, if I want to take, you know, a couple of months off and, and I have staff, then they can manage that. You know, I really wanted the, the opportunity to um, put everything that I knew about e-commerce and marketing and, and even some kind of subscription products that I'd been working on with a couple of clients to use in my own brand. Um, and it just came at a time that um, one of our clients that I had with the agency uh, that was probably one of our biggest clients 
um, decided to move everything that we were doing for them in-house. So I was like, well, you know, this I'll take it as a sign and, you know, this is the, the time and the date which I'll move everything to, to Whiskey Loot and, and kind of um, made arrangements for the staff that I currently have to, you know, give them notice and everything so they can find other, other work. And, and then I, I hired specifically um, over the course of a couple of years for, for Whiskey Loot where we've got a team of uh, 14 now. Mm, great. Oh, nice. Okay, that's really cool. So how has Whiskey Loot and then now recently Gin Loot, how has how's how's it been? Has it been really good for you guys? Has it been growing aggressively? Because the pandemic obviously was a big spike, right? But have you seen that a transition yeah, into yeah. 2021? Um, we've, we've definitely had a great 2021 to start with. Um, it's, it's similar to what we saw um, kind of between um, uh, December 2019 and, and January 2020. Um, in, in terms of percentages, it's probably about 10% better um, than, than where we were then. But January is always going to be a, a massive kind of hangover period <laughs> mm. um, from, from December. And there's no e-commerce or, or no kind of sales events that uh, that, that you can kind of um, uh, or tricks or anything like that that you can do to to mitigate that 100 percent obviously. So you just kind of got to um, work within it. Um, the the business, I think it's around 400 percent year on year growth, and, and the last kind of COVID period Shit. was about was about 10x on on that 400 um, percent. So it's just yeah, the the COVID kind of period for us was was amazing. Um, we uh, we you know had some pretty mind-boggling numbers from from what we were doing earlier in the year, kind of you know January February before everything kind of started to heat up with lockdowns. Um, but also it presented a whole heap of problems and challenges for us in terms of scaling uh, to meet that demand because essentially we we uh, we're, we're lucky enough to move warehouses in that period, so we're kind of a little bit prepared. Um, but we needed to onboard, you know, more customer service staff quite aggressively. We needed it to, you know, maintain and, and kind of um, invest more in, it, in our supply chain and getting more packaging um, into the country um, and also working with suppliers when, when they had constraints on their ends as well. Yeah, so that was an interesting point you said, Joel, um, from transitioning from, from agency to, you know, to, to liquor loot. And is there any, any key findings, lessons you've learned, you know, using this subscription model? Because it, it is, a, it, for me anyway, it, it, is, it is a courageous model to pursue, especially when it comes to alcohol, especially when there's a formula out there where just, you know, just sell liquor online as an e-commerce thing. Uh, but you've chosen to go this way. Um, any successes, disappointments, lessons you've learned um, choosing um, this particular model? Yeah, it's, it's a shitload more difficult than I thought it would be. <laughs> Um, and yeah. that was probably my naivety at the time and, you know, focusing on, on marketing. And I thought, you know, that that's the only thing that, that really matters in a business. And, you know, as long as you get people through the door, you can figure everything else out. Um, there was a, a, a lot of learnings when it came to supply chain and logistics and um, import, export, that, that type of stuff that was, that was very new to me, um, uh, as well as, you know, just, just kind of, you know, general business cash flow you know, making sure that you've got enough money in the bank um, to, yeah. to pay for the, the new subscribers you're acquiring, as well as, you know, making sure that you can stockpile what you need to, to um, hmm. ensure that, you know, you don't have any shortages when you actually get to delivery time. What, what I, I kind of found and, uh, and some of the issues early on um, were around the fact that you just you can't stop a subscription. Um, once it's going, you know, if, if you are... Uh, if you have a, a, a period of time where, um, you know, things are, are a little bit tight or you, um, you, you can't, uh, you know, find the particular whiskey that you need to fill a box, you've just got a deadline every month. That deadline comes up and every month you need to, you know, provide your consumers a product, um, which sounds like an easy thing to solve, but... Um, on that repetition, I think we had, you know, 36 months before we actually pivoted the model and changed it to what we've got today, which which is more of a consistent 12-month um, subscription experience that, that that is consistent for everyone. Um, but prior to that, we had a, a rolling monthly subscription that was new for, for every customer. And what, what that meant was that 
Um, we would need to, you know, track what we've sent people in the past. And we had customers that were, and, and still do have customers that have been around for that since that very first month. Um, and we always had a promise to our customers that we're never going to repeat a whiskey. So it's always learning something new and, and, and experiencing new distilleries. But, you know, if you have that promise and you've been going for three years and, and then someone signs up on that on that 36 month, they're not going to get any of those three year um, uh, those prior three years worth of inclusions because you've got a customer that signed up on month one and he's still around mm. and, and everything needs to be consistent um, for that month. You can't have one subscription that goes to you know X amount of people and one subscription that goes to five percent of that X. Um, so you really need to keep things consistent because there's so much collateral, um, and website and, and email content and, and marketing that, that goes along with that box that if you started to, you know, create different tiers and different channels and pathways for different people, it'd just be an absolute minefield. Yeah. Nice. Do you ever feel, do you ever feel worried that one day you're just going to run out of whiskey or gin just because every yeah. day you, I was thinking everyone is sending like three, I, I three. I felt stressed just hearing yeah, this. Like, I'll be like, oh, I, uh, I'm just going to send this, this one, but give it a different name. <laughs> give it a different name. <laughs> so so what, we've, what we've done now, which, which is the box that you guys have got, it says box kind of one of 12. Um, and what that means is when people sign up, we're assuming that uh, they're going to be in a uh, 12 12 month kind of subscription. Obviously, there's no commitment. It's month to month, cancel any time. But what that allows us to do is kind of pre plan all of those boxes with our partners, uh, with the distilleries to make sure that they've got the volumes to keep up with, with the demand as well. Um, and that means that, you know, someone signs up in, in January versus someone that signs up in, in you know, April, they're going to get the same 12 months. It just starts in January, right? April. So everyone's kind of on their own plan, but at least we can keep the stock of that um, within our um, warehousing and, and make sure we don't run out of stock for all those bottles because essentially we're actually a, a manufacturing business. Um, what we need to do is, is get the bulk spirit, have our empty bottles, use our bottling machinery that we've got, fill the bottles, cap them, put them in the boxes and, and send them out. Um, so that requires us to, you know, have, have a, a, a surety that it's going to be in stock and available for our subscribers. And that's how we get around the, the fact that we won't run out of gins or whiskeys because we're on this 12 month cycle. Um, and we've, we've built that with, with a shitload of investment, both in kind of the, the content that we're producing. I mean, we're, we're producing like a five minute professionally filmed and edited video to every gin or whiskey in the pack. That's 36 for whiskey, 36 for gin, plus another 12 educational videos um, that go in the packs as well and all delivered via email, um, plus the, yeah, the written content and, and printed content in the packs, plus all the emails that are synchronized. Um, so all of this needs to kind of be pre-built for the subscribers and that's the way we can kind of maintain the quality of the experience no matter when you sign up it's going to be the same great quality experience mm -hmm. where the outcome is going to be you know you're going to learn more about that that spirit whether it's risky or gin yeah it's great that, that's the content you see when you scan this qr code i'm, I'm showing on youtube on the video yeah, by the way yeah, that's so, right. yeah um yeah, cool. I have a couple of questions for you, but I know our time is running out, so I'll keep them brief. But in terms of back to that whole marketing side of things, in terms of liquor, in terms of marketing a liquor brand, what has worked? What do you, what have you found has worked the best for you? So if, what kind of strategies has, has really um, stuck out for you? Um, when, when it kind of comes to <clears throat> working with uh, local brands i guess yeah. uh we found that the um uh the smaller brands um that might have some really interesting stuff just mm -hmm. don't have the volumes or or are not priced within you know that the brackets we need to work with so it's about choosing the right supplier to work with um mm -hmm. and when it comes kind of comes to, to marketing i think we, we take people on a certain journey so kind of going and look like we had 36 months or, or something around that of that rolling subscription mm. where we learn what people like and what people don't like. And we actually created this 12-month kind of playlist series 
in a way that you start off on the easy whiskies, you grow and, and develop your palate, um, you know, from, from your, your single malt scotches to learn about your blends, to talk about Japanese whiskey, Australian, American, smoky stuff towards the end, as well as some really great well-known brand names um, yep. that you, you get to try, not, not only the, the up-and-coming brands, but some really well-known stuff that, that is some of it exclusively made just for us. Um, so it's that wow. planning process that is, yep. is really important from what we've learned in the past and what kind of is working now. Um, some of the earlier learnings were, I mean, we, we kind of A-B tested some different strategies for um, people signing up, like either $10 off the first month or a fourth bottle free. Um, we found that even though the fourth bottle free cost us slightly less than $10, it actually worked uh, better for those consumers to sign up. So instead of getting three bottles in a box, they got four. Um, we also found that actually mentioning what people got on their first box, even though that sounds a little bit counterintuitive, um, worked um, uh, worse than kind of just explaining the, the, the experience that they received. Mm -hmm. Um, so we went through a couple of, um, probably nearly a year on, on a previous website that we had, the branding wasn't that great. And we kind of had a, a bit of a, um, slap together landing page type approach. Um, and we would rotate the bottles every month on this rolling subscription and we'd advertise that particular month. Um, so, you know, the three bottles that re you were receiving in that month, but we would need to kind of advertise it the month before. So if we're advertising february we need to start advertising it in january and you know the february 2020 box and you'd sign up in january and you wouldn't receive it till the end of february so what we found was kind of delivering that box instantaneously when that person subscribed or you know obviously you know it would leave the warehouse within a couple of hours of that person subscribing was a lot better than our previous model um which was all synchronized around the middle of the month so on the you know the 15th of the month call it yeah all of the boxes would go out. That means that someone that signed up on the 16th of last month had to wait nearly a whole month to receive their first box. Um, yeah. And that was an issue we, we definitely needed to work around um, in, in kind of that, that user experience perspective as well. Yep. I got it. Um, okay, so now we're gonna go quick fire. Uh, standard SOP questions, man. Because um, <laughs> I, I think we I, we have a lot more questions, but I really want to get some of these out there because a lot of our listeners are entrepreneurs or people looking at um, specific industries and trying to really learn from people who've done it, right? I think that's really cool. I, I, also, did I just see you neck down the whiskey? Nice. Oh, I still got some left. <laughs> <laughs> oh, nice. Okay, cool. Yeah, well, after Tony's question, I'd love to ask you about the whiskey, by the way. Yeah. Oh, yeah, we'll definitely <laughs> get to that as well. So, um like what were maybe you can tell us right um what were some of the challenges that you faced right like obviously logistical issues and everything there but what were, what were some of the concerns or challenges that you faced before you actually started something like uh Likalu? because i know we touched on it a little bit but i really wanted to get into that a little bit more because you were doing things your your career really wasn't you know in alcohol right you didn't have that background per se so like what made you take that leap into something that's completely different uh what made me take the leap yeah. um uh I, i've always kind of loved businesses i've, I've loved the challenge of, of creating something new and i've been passionate about whiskey for for a very long time i i knew the things that i knew and i also knew the things that i didn't know and what i needed to kind of um, uh, either learn very quickly or find people that, that could help out. Um, and I did both of those things quite actively. I was, you know, talking to lots of people that have run um, businesses in the alcohol space, you know, um, Good Pair Days is you know, one of my mates who, who runs that, which is a wine subscription business. You know, I, I you know, tapped on his shoulder early on and then, you know, can I kind of explain the concept, um, talk to one of the original founders of BWS and explain the concept um, I was getting feedback uh, as much as I could. Some of it was kind of like, you know, these are going to be the problems. Other were, other people said, you know, that's it's a crazy idea or, or it won't work or you need to check all these, you know, all these rules and regulations and, and make sure, you know, you're ticking the boxes. Um, and, and others were, you know, this is great. This is going to go like wildfire. Wish you the best of luck. Um, I'll point you in the right direction. 
Um, but uh, I, I, th I think, you know, the, the, the challenges early on beyond um, finding um, the right people was just having the confidence to try something new as well. Um, so I, I think what you need to do with a startup is, is just be willing to fail um, and not holding yourself to that failure. The failure doesn't represent you. It, it just represents the idea that you have. And uh, ideas are a commodity. I think, you know, you can come up with one one day and it can be the next or taken over and, and someone else can do it. Um, but it was never your idea. Or it was just an idea out there that's probably going to be done by someone else sometime. Um, mm -hmm. So if you yeah. think you're the right person to do it, then go forth and, and kind of try and achieve your goals. Uh, you know, what we did early on was, was try and talk to the distilleries and, and I got, you know, three, uh, I reached out to three um, uh, distilleries uh, who were either represented by the brand themselves or a distributor or a wholesaler. And I said, okay, this is what we're trying to do. Tell me what you think. And, and all three of them said, yep, that sounds great. And I said, okay, put pen to paper because it's so easy to get a yes in this world um, and that yes might be worth nothing. And you can kind of have that, that false sense of security by moving forward without actually getting someone to put something in writing um, because they're just trying to, you know, get the conversation over and done with quickly and a yes costs them nothing. So I got, you know, expressions of interest or, or um, yeah, expressions of interest to be put down on a piece of paper and kind of, you know, work with them on pricing and, and all these type of things um, and move forward with a little bit more confidence like that. Yeah, speaking of putting pens to paper, that's exactly what I got my fiancé to do when I proposed. So when she said yes, <laughs> I said, pen to paper. <laughs> has, has to be in writing. That was the prenup, right? She hasn't signed it yet. <laughs> 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 she hasn't signed it yet but um okay so you're also getting investment into into uh into liquor loot right and is, is that was yep. that a first fee as well getting investors yeah, on board? that that was wasn't a first actually um the what i previously mentioned just quickly was the real estate startup that i was working on um and yep. uh within kind of you know the, the first 12 months that we were playing around with that idea we, we got some investment um, and uh, I eventually ended up leaving that business as, as co-founder and, and passed, passed the buck to the, to the original founder. Um, but I learned a lot in that experience as well. Um, and uh, really, I mean, I, I'm, I'm the sole founder. I've got a great team behind me, but I'm the sole founder um, of Liquor Loot. Um, and that gives itself, you know, some challenges in itself. Um, and that's... Mm finding the investors, you know, develop network, um, developing all the documentation and, and, you know, working with the advice of, of, of lawyers and, and other advisors uh, that you might come across to, you know, you know prepare the data room and, and all that type of stuff. Um, mm. But I, I actually really enjoy that. I, I like the nitty gritty of kind of the planning process. And I think, you know, my, my first um, information memorandum was like 64 pages long just because I, I, I also found it to be quite, um, quite a good process to kind of put all the ideas on paper and, and really have a great understanding of that, of that roadmap and, and the growth and the, and the projections and all, all the fundamentals of the business because it gives yourself a lot of confidence um, instead of just kind of, you know, going blindly that a lot of um, founders and especially bootstrap businesses go blindly somewhat because they're not held up to that responsibility of, of and I wouldn't call it answering to an investor, but just giving them general updates. Um, you know, you, you want your updates to be positive. You want your updates to kind of, you know, talk about not only the good stuff, um, but highlight where you need help and, and what challenges uh, you might see coming. It allows you to think about those challenges as well. All right, I, I think yeah. I think we're we're a little bit short on time, so uh, I've got one last question, and Dave, maybe uh, you might have one after that. Um, yeah. So my question, I mean, this is this is a, I'm just gonna I'm gonna softball it to you, uh, Joel. Yeah. So, like, what's next for uh, liquor loot, like gin loot and and whiskey loot? So there's gonna be more in the loot family. Oh, nice. Okay. Any gonna, any any uh, hints? Any hints? Um, kind of do. Um, we're we're uh, looking looking at a couple at the moment. Um, 
excuse me, um, there's either a combination of a few in, um, under one umbrella or we'll do them individually. Um, but there's, there's de definitely going, going to be a, a representation of, um, of rum on the horizon because I think uh, Australians love their rum. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, we're a homegrown Aussie startup, so we're going to focus on Australia to start with. Um, and then beyond that, we're looking at um, expansion uh, to overseas markets. Um, so we're actually looking at Singapore. So anyone that's listening that, you know, run, runs a warehouse or supply chain or um, any, anything to do with alcohol in Singapore, please reach out. I'd, I'd love to have a conversation um, as well as uh, probably a, a couple of other countries up our sleeve uh, by the end of 2022. How's the drink? Good. And, and, I, and I love, sorry, <laughs> before you answer that, I'd love to know how you describe a drink because I'm just so, I'm so inarticulate when it comes to describing <laughs> things. I'll just say if they're good it, or they're bad, which is it, horrible it because tastes, we have a podcast about <laughs> drinks. It, it, it requires uh, kind of a, a lot of um, um, comparisons of what you're trying to or what you're tasting to other things that you can remember. And that skill takes a bit of practice. Um, so I, I would say, you know, practice makes, makes perfect with that type of thing. And also trying different types of spirits, not just whiskey. If you want to develop your palate, you know, try gins, try tequilas, try vodkas, try um, cognac, you know, brandy, all that type of stuff, <clears throat> because you can kind of get a lot of different flavor profiles that, that represent maybe in a very subtle way in the whiskey, but you wouldn't have picked up on it if you didn't have, say, brandy, for instance. I've got a couple of other ones here that, that I love. This is um, a little bit left of this one, but this is a Caroa. Uh, so this is a single barrel um, cask French oak, 61.8%. So absolute big hitter. Um, one of my favorite Aussie distilleries. We've got um, Kabbalan, which is a oh, Taiwanese yeah. um, uh, Oloroso Sherry cask. Single malt there as well. And uh, one of my favorite American whiskeys got here, which is a um, Willet Thrill small batch rye. Um, and if everyone, um, if everyone um, listening hasn't had a rye, definitely try a rye. They're... Um, Probably not as popular as the single malts, but they, they are a full flavor. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah I've got a terrible whiskey collection in comparison. I'm not going to show mine. That's, that's embarrassing. My one is embarrassing. All right. <laughs> you have a good gin collection, though. You have, you have a massive shelf full of empty gin bottles. Yeah, you drank most of it when you were here. So, um. <laughs> um, drink yeah. responsibly, everyone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, make sure you drink responsibly, everyone. <laughs> Hey, Joel, so um, usually like to leave the flow open a little bit if you have anything that you want to share um, before before we end the podcast. Do you have anything else that maybe we didn't touch on or you wanted to bring up real quick? I'd love to kind of, you know, help people and, and um, provide expertise. I mean, um, I'm starting to, to advise other businesses as well. Um, not that, you know, I want to get back to an agency or anything like that, but I, I love helping entrepreneurs out. Um, so maybe people can reach out with, with specific questions if they have around kind of, you know, launching an e-commerce brand or, you know, what's the difference between building a brand and doing something like drop shipping. <laughs> um, oh, we're going to get, we're going to get a lot, lot of, we're going to get a lot of retargeting <laughs> for that one. <laughs> All right. So Joel, so what we'll yeah, do is it's, we'll, it's, been a, we'll, it's been a wild ride for me. So I'd have to help people um, to navigate that themselves. Awesome. So what we'll do is we'll put your LinkedIn, we'll put your personal email, mobile number, address in in, <laughs> in the and on a website so people can contact you at any point a postal address <laughs> postal joel address. is available 24 7 guys holidays <laughs> is perfect that's when he has the most amount of free time just call him on holidays <laughs> i think having someone who jumped from agency to a startup and especially in the alcohol industry which is I mean, can be really brutal. It's quite specific. It's, it's a lot, it, there's not a lot of comparisons that can be made, even in the F&B segment. So that's quite interesting to really get your insights into it. Also, thank you so much for the gin that I've just finished my glass. So that's, that's my bad. Um, yeah, Dave, uh, empty. Really good. Dave anything, anything else that you want to share? No, thanks so much for your time, Joel. It was really good. And, and um, obviously, 
Joel just opened up the floor for any questions people may have about business and so forth. We may relate back to Joel and he can respond to us with, with a good answer. So feel free to hit us up at hello at business.com or comment on, 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 on this video or, or podcast and any, any of our, on any of our platforms with a question and, and we'll get back to you with, with an answer from Joel, hopefully. Yeah, that's it. And it, obviously we'll, we'll add a link to Whiskey Loot and a pretty good deal. Uh, in our show notes, so just check us out at businessoverdrinks.com. Go to our sponsored section or our show notes section for a link to to Joel's website and to start to subscribe. It's a really great product for someone like me who needs to learn much more about how gin and whiskey works. I think it's perfect. So um, thanks for your time, Joel. Thanks for having me on the show. Yeah. Hey, thanks, Joel. Thanks, Appreciate it, man.